I'm super humbled to uh, you know be able to come down here and speak. And you know, I found myself on the three speakers earlier, not in my head a lot. You could tell everybody's been around and in the game. Look, I, I want to have you guys for the most part ask me the hardest, most hot topics, uh, whatnot. But a couple things that uh, Sam and I said we'd touch on is my bio a little bit, which is easy. And the other question was, what would I like to know before I became a CEO, which is a lot harder of a question. But just real quick on my bio, I'm going to run through it. Uh, born and raised in Long Beach. I don't know why, but I'm super fucking proud of that. Uh, went to school at, uh, we grew up smoking young there, you know, 13, 14, and then uh, went to school at Berkeley. Uh, you know, once I got there, I kind of got deeper into the actual, you know, cultivation, uh, you know, moving packs. If I'm being honest, I was selling fucking everything, right? Um, but, you know, we had our little three-lighter, all that fun shit going. You know, right around that time, the first time I could vote was 96, which was when 215 passed, so it got high as fuck. Didn't care who was going to be president. In fact, if I recollect, I think I voted for Ralph Nader. Back then, I was... Uh, I had dreadlocks, a goatee, never thought I'd be like a hardcore uh, capitalist, thought I'd just, you know, wander the earth in my uh, Birkenstocks. So, you know, we had, a good, we had a good run there. I was a little fucking, you know, hustler, whatever. Most of the packs back then were coming out of BC that we were getting up in, uh, you know, Berkeley. So we chop it up and move them and whatever. Uh, so then, you know, from there, traveled around a little bit. You know, it didn't take me long when I was overseas, growing a little bit, got into, you know, moving a little bit of hash. A long story over there for another time, uh, but when I came back, I got my real estate license in uh, 2004, um, and then from there, that was really like kind of my way back into uh, cannabis. So, you know, the short version of that story is smoked a lot of meth, uh, had a total implosion, uh, filed bankruptcy in 2008. My house was in foreclosure. That's when I met my wife, Anna. Um, from there, um, and then, you know, I went full sober for like three years. Didn't smoke cannabis probably for like five or six years. Um, you know, just was, that's what I needed at my, that point in my life. So uh, we met, my house was like a month from being foreclosed. We actually conceived our daughter at my mama's house. Uh, I had to live there for like only a month. Uh, we, as soon as we found out she was pregnant, we were rolling around looking for a two, bed ba two bedroom, one bath apartment with roommates. So her sister kind of came by and was looking at us like, what the fuck? We were, uh, she was like four or five months pregnant, showing two bed, one bath apartment. We had roommates, uh, closed a couple of real estate deals, gave him a little bit of money to move out. And, uh, you know, so from there, uh, after I went busted, we started flipping houses. We did pretty good at that. We had a good run. That's like through 2013. And so at that time, my buddies from Berkeley came back into the picture and they just were continuously growing. So, you know, as far as like legacy or cannabis culture goes, you know, I miss most of the, uh, the 2000s, so that's just, you know, you know, part of my story. But they came back and they were like, hey, look, man, you know, could you find us a, a place? So long story short, you know, we started growing in L.A. indoor, Compton indoor. Um, then we started putting up hoop houses. Sean back there. <laughs> that's how we linked up somewhere along that line. Again, we were just kind of cowboys that didn't know what we were doing. But, you know, we ended up with 50 hoop houses up north. And then right around that time, um, you know, it was way better time, you know, whatever, you know, duffel bags and just, you know, you didn't have to get it all through testing. Guys just rolled in one shot. You know, we were, we were growing a lot of weed. Um, and, you know, that, again, that was my end because I was able to get property and everybody that I knew. But I just kept meeting more and more uh, people. You know, they had most of their money was, you know, kind of, you know, buried or whatever. So, you know, when, when the cannabis thing came to Long Beach, I was like, all right, I'm just going to get one of these. It's coming to my hometown. Let's fucking go. So the objective was just to get one cannabis dispensary license, you know, now I had, you know, kind of been back in it for, you know, whatever, three-ish years, and my antennas were up enough, I read the ordinance. Anyway, we ended up getting sick, sold two off to kind of fund the rest of it, and then, boom, we just started going city to city, and, you know, just became the accidental uh, CEO that, that, that I am today. Uh, you know, just one day I took the title. I don't even think that we don't have a board or anything official. I just one day was like, hey, I'm the CEO. Uh, I don't even think that's an actual official uh, title. It's actually Anna was the one who, I'll give her the credit. So my old Instagram handle was like Elliot Lewis 562 and she's like, you should change it to Catalyst CEO. And I was like, I don't know, it seems a little cheeky. This is like 2019, 20, before I was really even using the platform at all, right? And so I did flip it over. I think that's when I started referring to myself as, uh, you know, CEO. So that's it, you know, whatever we, you know, we, it looks good from the outside. 
Uh, you know, I heard a lot of the speakers drop a lot of knowledge on it, but, you know, it's super fucking hard game. We're barely getting by, you know, just balancing the whole thing is fucking damn near impossible. Everybody's suffering, and, uh, you know, we're just doing our best to move forward. You know, so the question was asked, what would I have wanted to know before I came CEO? And, and you know, same thing with life. Like, you know, I don't really have regrets for not knowing stuff. It's a super dynamic thing. You know, I think I, th the big thing would be, you know, just don't trust as many people. It's a sad thing to say, uh, but, you know, just I trusted too many people and, you know, paid the price. You know, now I'm super guarded. Um, even people I trust, I verify, you know, in any way I can. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just, you know, what it is. I think that would have been a nice, you know, lesson to know. A lot of the other stuff that I could tell the future me, I don't think I'd even want to know. Like, this shit's going to be the worst fucking idea you ever had, right? Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's like a bad acid trip. Like, we're in it, so we might as well keep marching forward. We took it. It's like two hours. You know, you don't know what it's going to be, and you just, you know, keep your hope, you know, hope you keep going. So, you know, again, much more than that, like what I could know, you know, I always say, like, you know, nobody gave me a handbook on how to be CEO of a cannabis company. It doesn't exist. You know, things are going to change. Federal legalization being, you know, I think the big, big thing that's going to, change everything but just staying nimble and being on it and then you know it's kind of funny everybody in the company looks to me for the answer because i am you know the ceo and you know i do my best to come up with one but you know it's not always the right one and then you know a lot of the stuff the advice i give myself is still advice i give myself that i'm still learning like yo dog have a little better impulse control oh whoops yeah we didn't quite get that one right you don't have to tell people everything you're thinking well you know get a little better at that but uh you know it just kind of comes with uh you know what it is. I will say this is we've gotten further in the game. Um, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of rivalries that are getting, you know, lessened and, you know, we're having meetings with some of the bigger players that I wouldn't say we were beefing with, that we were competing with, and we're realizing all that we're, you know, kind of in the same fight together. So, you know, the best we can, there's always a few exceptions, you know, like the worst of the worst, not to bring up Speedy Weedy. That's the worst of the worst, right? <laughs> They are the worst of the worst. That's it. I don't know if they're here or not, but their they're, they're business model is robbing people. I'm fine to bring that up, right? But at the end of the day, like, the, you know, the vast majority of us are all just, you know, uh, trying to survive. And, and I used this metaphor the other day off the cuff, and I liked it. You know, I, what's that show called? Game of Thrones. So it's kind of like that, right? This idea is that, you know, the Lannisters were fighting the whoever's, whatever, and they saw it once. Then at the very end, everybody realizes, like, wait a minute, the fight's against the fucking undead. So they lay down all their weapons and we're fighting the undead. And to me, the undead hasn't showed up yet, right? And the undead is gonna be big pharma, tobacco, federal legalization. So we're trying to build these alliances now with what used to be rivals. And look, there's benefits to, you know, making an alliances with allies. When we apply in a city, I respect this dude's game. I wanna go to the other side of uh, town. That's the business, right? But I do think in the long run, if we're not thinking like that, the fight's gonna be against the undead the culture, the industry, the cool shit about it, it's gonna be smashed out. And if you think there was some money that was injected in this fucking game, it wasn't, right? That was just some fucking white belt, yellow belt Chad fucking money. The black belt Chad money's coming. And the way they write that federal legalization law, you know was gonna favor that. So, um, you know, if you're not crewing up now and planning for that in four or five years, uh, I think you're gonna get caught, you know, uh, flat footed. So that's kind of everything I have on the, on the intro. I mean, ask me the most fucked up, hardest question, the thing you think I'd want to answer the least, because I do think uh, as you penetrate different levels of knowledge in this game, and I say this in a humble way, or you just see more stuff, you know, look, a 40 second post, that's a little therapeutic. By the way, I, if you told me four years ago I'd be posting on fucking Instagram, I'd be like, no, no, but now I love it. I'm just, I'll be honest, I like it. Um, sometimes I just do it to get something out. Uh, and, you know, look, sometimes I know I'm grabbing eyeballs, but generally, um, you know, we're trying to touch on things that are important or something happens during the day. And I'm like, oh, that's it. That's a thing. And then, you know, a lot of people that don't realize that, you know, I have this 80 hour a week day job and literally spend maybe three to five minutes uh, actually getting the post out there on Instagram. I'll just literally walk out in the street or I'll do it in the morning while I'm drinking my uh, cup of coffee. To me, the really interesting stuff that happens is the stuff that's happening, uh, you know, throughout the day. So, you know, fire away. If you guys got anything, again, just super impressed with everybody who, uh, you know, 
spoke before, really, you know, knowledge, knowledgeable and gamed up on what's going on. And, and thanks so much to Blunt Talks. It's like super humbling to be here uh, talking to you all. At what exact point during the Weed Maps debacle did you realize that you had gone wrong? By the way, that was the question I want to answer least. <laughs> I'll tell the real story. I'll tell the whole story. You want to hear the whole story? Uh, I mean, look, I'm open book. It's the whole story. So uh, we were, they, they raised the, uh, the price from, you know, the bottom tiles from like 1500 to 1700 So like we were pretty low key about it. Hey, you know, that's just a little too much. Let's try to make it on our, our own. And I was never really like, Hey, this is a capitalist society. They're, they're, they're providing value X. They're allowed to charge whatever you want. And it's whether or not we want to pay for it. Look, our buyer is the same. We're allowed to pay whatever we want to pay. So we were, you know, it's now it's September 21st and I get called, you know, we're, I'm in the marketing office and they're like, dude, we need it for the new stores. Cause our old kind of strategy was like, let's thump the new stores, keep the bottom listing. After we, you know, thump the new store, we'll get a decent tile and then keep the bottom listing and just roll with that. And hopefully word of mouth and customer retention takes over. So I'm in the room, we got Bree, Nate, uh, Liz, our, you know, all our marketing people in there. And they're like, dude, we gotta keep these tiles extended. Like it's the 21st, like we gotta go a little bit longer. You know, we're opening new stores and we're having the whole debate live. It's like literally happening. I'm like, I don't know, you know, whatever, what should we do? So like, they almost got me to a yes. We're at least gonna extend them out a couple months on like probably five or six of the newer stores. And then, uh, I get a call from one of our guys, uh, Jordan, and he's like, bro, they kicked us off the fucking platform. And I was like, what the fuck? They kicked us off the platform. And so we were supposed to cycle out October 1st. So we got kicked out off September 1st while we're discussing it. So, you know, my dumb ass was like, it's a sign from God. Fuck weed math special, hip shot, let's go. That's literally how it happened. So I was like, put it in, this is like Friday. We'll start rolling it Monday, we'll get new customers. Fuck it, let's roll. So anyway, a little bit of time goes by, and like, if I'm just being straight up, you know, the new stores are suffering, right? Like, this is real talk. And I'm like, fuck, all right, let's, I'm pushing, we're bringing in all sorts of new marketing assets, trying to get the fucking thing, uh, you know, going, right? And uh, so anyway, I go on Be Real's podcast, and, uh, you know, we smoke a little bit, whatever, not a big day smoker, you know, after I talk, I'm gonna get high as fuck, but like to stay articulate. And then, you know, I, you know, I'm like, it's a two hour thing, so I'm checking all my things. And I got a text from Weed Maps, which is, hey man, you wanna have a conversation? And I'm thinking like, fuck, I thought I burned that bridge fucking permanently. There was no going back. So I'm a little bit relieved. We're like 16, 17 days. So now like, all right, we're gonna probably get back on the platform. So, you know, I hit him up, we're chatting. Apparently the cutoff was a miscommunication. I take them at their word, like we kind of piece it out. So I know I'm gonna probably go back on. It's just a matter of how we're gonna do it and you know, what's gonna happen. So it actually, of all the fucking anxiety, everything I ever had, right? This was like the worst, that's my wife. She was even feeling sorry for me, which doesn't happen much, right? And I was just like, man, I'm gonna flip flop on this motherfucker. It's a whole fucking thing. Oh God, all right, well, whatever. So I'm kind of going through this whole process and we have a grand opening in Figueroa that Saturday. And I'm like, fuck. I don't even want to go like I'm not even in the mood and I used I love popping up doors so like literally I'm like dude it's gonna come up I already know cuz it's kind of hot so right when I park my car I'm walking up first guy out customers and our grand openings our most loyalist catalyst crew they're watching in Instagram fuck weed maps and I'm like oh no I know by Monday we're gonna be back on so now I'm like sick I walk into the venue and like four or five more people are like Fuck weed, man. I'm like, oh, man. So then even people I know, some are actually here. Uh, I won't say, you know, they're like, hey, how's that going? I'm like, actually, bro, uh, I'm about to go back on, you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, anyway, long story short, we end up back on the platform. Uh, we truced it out. Everything is good. And, you know, the, the lesson from that is like, yo, dude, just slow down a little bit. That was a very consequential decision. And at the end, you know, they made it right. Uh, you know, you know, the, the early kickoff was really how the beef escalated to what it uh, escalated to. And then at the end of the day, like, we do need weed maps. And like, if we're being objective, right, uh, they, they were the ones that were doing it that blazed a lot of trails, you know, early on. Like, nobody was willing to do that. Google wasn't willing to do that. 
And then just from a business owner standpoint, you know, when the full flip flop, you know, came, it was like, I, I got people to feed. I got shareholders. I got fucking, it's just a complex issue. I got 500 people. So I was like, I was going to fall on my sword, say I'm a flip flop and ass bitch because that's what it is uh, and do it. But it was, uh, you know, a whole interesting thing. But definitely like, you know, back to like, you know, come on, dog, learn a little impulse control. There was really no reason to take it that level. However, I did think it was some like extraterrestrial godlike sign that while we were debating it, they kicked us off the platform, right, uh, 10 days early. So that's the, uh, the Wee Mask platform. All peaceful, better to, you know, again, there's always a few exceptions, but really trying to, uh, you know, do a better job of keeping peace within the industry. And they are uh, an important part of it. And, you know, I joked when John was speaking, somebody asked what the most effective plat uh, uh, media is in cannabis today, and I leaned over and said, weed maps. Uh, tongue in cheek, but it might actually uh, be that. So, uh, and it was good. We gave it like an 18, 19 day test. I was rocking, looking at all the new patient counts. I'm checking the score on everything all the time, see, split testing, seeing what's working, what's not. So no doubt, major impact on the new stores. We're really good at customer retention, but just not having a listing up there uh, would be, we, it would be a net loss to us. It's just the easiest way to uh, put it. But that's the weed map story, for better or for worse, exactly how the fuck it happened. Thank you for that story. Um, two questions, which also have subset questions, but the first being, what do you think are the three things that are most important in running a dispensary? And the second question is, for a mom and pop shop starting off, what are the best ways to be profitable? Yeah, or so, can you? So it, it, I actually have three things. It's, it's so funny you say that. So I, I used to interview everybody that at one time. So my record is 18 in a day. I think it's super important that they hear from me. Now I'll do it in a group. Before we open a store, I'll fly up to Daly City and I'll tell them. The number one thing that I cannot control is super important, not just with the customer, but with your coworkers, is vibe. Keep the vibe up. Keep the vibe high. So when I do my interviews, uh, you know, I tell them everything that I want Catalyst to be about, what the vision is, and I want them to hear it from fucking me, right? So, you know, you do a group interview, the vibe. The menu and the price will take care of that. This is literally what I say, right? If you're in one of my first interviews, you're going to hear some version of this. We'll take care of the menu and the price. I need you guys to take care of the vibe. And the customer is either always right or banned for life. There's no fucking in between, right? If they're being a little bit of a dick or a cunt, excuse the language. My wife hates that word, by the way. Uh, sorry, the C, but whatever, that, that's cool. Like if they cross the line and they get into violence, racial, whatever, you know, really threatening, then you're banned for life, don't come back. Otherwise you're having a little bit of a bad day. Like it's our job to flip it. And some of the craziest cray cray fucking people that we flip have become our most loyal customers. And then I personally fix uh, every order so like that ever comes to me if there's ever a complaint there's been like four I couldn't fix because they went too far but if there's ever a complaint I clear my direct messages every night it's getting harder but it's something I like to do and like if you reach out you sent me a message I want to clear it I get a lot of unsatisfied customers my general rule of thumb is I'll give them a hundred dollars worth of product for a dollar try to make it right sometimes 200 uh, and every once in a while too a guy will text me it's his birthday he'll say something nice I'll just kick him down I text the GM and I get his number, that's why I have two phones. I give my other phone number, usually, and then send that to the GM, and, we, and we, we take care of the order. As far as, you know, so menu and price, vibe, super, super important. Um, you know, the, the, and they're just running lean, right? And then, you know, with the marketing aspect, you know, we're, getting, we're bringing in more assets now, but in the beginning when we were starting out, it was just really organic and guerrilla marketing. And then, you know, in particular, just developing that relationship the best you can, whether you're a brand or a dispensary with uh, uh, the customer. The one advantage that we start to have, and which will be interesting to play out, that you don't have as a mom and pa, is we have purchasing power, right? So, you know, if you're buying X amount of X brand and they get one drop, and then we're distributing it from there, that gives us a, a, a pricing advantage now. And then, you know, we do our best always to, actually, no, we just do, not even our best. We pass that on, you know, to the consumer. So price, menu, vibe, definitely the, the highest three. What was the other, there was another part, the subset? Yeah, I got them, I got them all. As a mom and pop, like how do you, what are the best ways to be profitable as yeah, a dispensary? Yeah, same thing, run it lean, right? I mean, uh, I just, you know, until there's any proof of concept on anything, 
I wouldn't go down that line, right? Like, you know, a lot of the big guys that bust it out, they spend a shitload of money on these crazy marketing plans. It's just not that kind of marketplace right now. So you just got to run it really lean. I mean, we got, you know, just keep it basic, whether it's a street team, whether it's going door to door in the neighborhood, whether it's, you know, obviously Weed Maps is a, uh, a good one, whether it's, you know, putting yourself out there on uh, Instagram, like get them in the door. And then if you got menu price and vibe, they're going to keep coming back. So our, our customer retention, I'm really proud of that is, is a, you know, is, is great. But again, your, your big disadvantage is going to be, you know, whatever product X that you might have to pay 24 because you're new. I might be able to pay 16, 17 and therefore be able to outprice you and make the same margin. It's not a fair world, but that's a reality uh, that we're living in. If you're looking for a location, parking is number one. Freeway access is number two. How many dispensaries near you is number three in that order. If you don't have parking, fuck it. Is it the, the roof is there. And then, you know, freeway access is great. All our stores that crack, you know, 80% of the people aren't coming from within five miles. They're getting on, they're getting off, and they, they keep going. So selecting a location actually is probably the most important thing you can do. You know, we have stores that do 200 grand, one store that does 200, store that does 2 million. We run them the fucking same and everything in between. And that's just based on the genetics of the, of the store, right? So... So speaking of the undead, how do you deal with adversarial city council or local regulators to, to do make it difficult when you're trying to expand? Yeah, so you know, California is the worst place to do business on the planet. It can't, California cannabis is even worse, right? You know, I'm a half full guy though, so I you know, I've used this before, but you know, I, I always tell our crew, look, man, we're American fucking ninja warriors. I don't know if you guys know that show, right? Would you rather run a 40-yard dash? You'd rather take it to the motherfucking obstacle course, right? So that's our attitude. And why money hasn't been able to buy this game is local control, overtaxation, and all these things you need to work through. What's gotten me in trouble and why I no longer post what city I'm about to go to is they will take my Instagram and they will send it my opposition research, right? The, the oppos everybody's got an opposition research in retail when you're in licensing battles. My general opposition research is I talk too much shit and I'm gonna cause too much trouble, right? Which, that's arguably true. Uh, so, you know, and I don't, I don't walk away from that. But, you know, look, it's, a, it, it, it's been a double-edged sword. It, like, I didn't do it on purpose when I was doing it. Now I'm very self-aware, we keep it authentic, but you know, we built this brand and this ethos, which is a good thing. It has political backlash and ramifications. So like, it's not totally announced. Maybe I'll just fucking announce it here. Uh, you know, we're gonna close Anna's January 13th. Trumped up charges, $2 beers. I could get into the whole fucking thing, but because we brought up police and fire overtime, the long arm of the government comes to get you. Because we are, uh, you know, I won't say what city yet, we're working on a license transfer, and I had to get interviewed with the police chief, which is super fucking annoying. And what are they bringing up? Patterson, California, because when we inherited that store, it had a million dollar in illegal back taxes. All they see is us not paying. The main thing that they were concerned with, right, was what the fuck is the deal in Patterson, California? So, um, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing. And look, as far as applying for licenses, we've been putting the same application forward for years. We finished 99.8 and 81. So like, I don't know how they grade them. At the end of the day, what really happens is they do this really good process in their mind, and then before they know it, the real estate developer buddy, the guy who has, you know, whatever, the trash contract buddy, they want to get in the cannabis business, and they owe. So then there's three spots that they shouldn't have given up. What we have done has been pretty successful is we litigate, right? So we've sued like 13 cities. Some people call us litigious. I say that we relentlessly pursue justice. My general theory is we never leave any soldiers behind. And if we won the process, I usually think it's totally fair and above board and legit. If we lose, it was corrupt, it was bullshit, and we got fucked and we're suing. There's a little bit of truth in that, but I'm being sarcastic. So at the end of the day, like, we've been really good at doing postmortems. You can't, you can't prove that this guy had undue influence. And like, everybody talks about the bribing. Fuck the bribing. The real shit is American politics is controlled by money. As long as somebody doesn't have the conversation, I'm gonna give you this, and you're gonna give me that, which is the quid pro quo. They could give, 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 and we all know what's gonna happen, right? It doesn't need to be said out loud. So that's another element 
um, that happens, but we've been good at looking after the fact and saying, hey, you took four points off our applications because our, our architect used one fourth quarter inch walls and you said it should have been one eighth, but your buddy here, he also used one eighth and you didn't take four points off his. And so what's ended up happening, actually the only one we tried, we lost, that was in Morro Bay, Helios Day Spring. We knew we actually bribed the guy for 100,000. He pled guilty to it at his deposition said he didn't uh, bribe so-and-so for 100,000. Pled guilty, he's doing three and a half years. They always settle out generally. Why? They don't want us to look under the hood and actually prove that there was cronyism and corruption. But local control, love it or hate it, is actually preventing the money from totally taking over the game, and it favors a group that's nimble and agile and Kaizen knows how to kind of work their uh, you know, way around. So it's an interesting question. I'd like to see more cities uh, you know, open it up, but uh, you know, look, some generally most cities we're in fucking love us. Even some we've sued the fuck out of. Just had cigars with uh, one of the city managers the other day. Fucking loves us, right? Uh, but you know, again, my own hometown, they fucking hate our guts. I won't get into the whole thing. But we've paid political consequences uh, for being outspoken. Uh, you know, we got auditors living at our office. I'm pretty confident we're the most inspected and definitely the most audited uh, cannabis company in California today. There's no question about it. I mean, I don't know everybody else's audit rate, but mine's like, you know, through the roof, not just the audits, you know, whatever. So we know we're under a radar. So we're really, really careful on our, our compliance stuff. I mean, not under the radar, but yeah. Thanks. If uh, you were appointed the director of DCC tomorrow, what, are a, what would a couple be your first order of businesses? Uh, I'd, I'd probably fire Gavin Newsom as a first order of business and Nicole Elliott, right? So look, they just need a tax holiday and then everything would resolve itself. And the, the, you know, in, what, what I think they should do is they should eliminate the excise tax. They don't need it. The reason the excise tax exists is there's three allocations of why they can't get rid of it. When they say allocation three, what they really mean is the SEIU. The SEIU is one of the most powerful lobbies in the state, maybe, you know, as far as a union, maybe be behind the teachers union, the environmentalists, and the police get that. So we have a $300 billion budget, about a billion going to cannabis tax. They don't need the money. Right, but like, if we got rid of the excise tax, did a sales tax holiday, and capped out the cities at like three percent, I'm okay paying cities a little bit. They need to plug their budget holes. I'm not sympathetic to the big cities that have, you know, uh, big market share. And then I think what they they should do, as far as like, if you're in the legal side, you're in the legal side, right? Everybody knows the glass house issue. My solution to that, and look. We all know that everybody's burning 20, 30% to fucking keep the lights on. That's a whole different thing. My opinion is to get me in trouble, but whatever. We'll say it. I don't think Glass House is actually really running a business, which is my issue with it, right? Um, let me preface all this because I'm being sued for defamation. But like just basic math, if you gave them every store in the state, they couldn't sell all the weed they're claiming to sell. Every store, they claim to be vertically integrated on 10 stores, right? Through their own earnings, 350,000 pounds, be like 40%. I could get into all the math, right? And they admit in their own stores, they don't clear 25%. So that, you know, they do need to get rid of the burner problem, but if they do that, the industry will collapse. So it has to be done simultaneously. And then I don't think anybody should get in trouble. You should just get a rating. By the way, I have a guy on record from Metric saying that they could fix this problem easily if they wanted to. And in our, if you want to just touch on the glass house thing, it's a discovery case. We're trying to get the metric. We're trying to get their list of distributors. They're trying to stop us. I think we're going to get it. We're in trench warfare. We filed multiple motions to compel. Uh, metric, DCC, and glass house appear to be working in coordination, right? And what a lot of people don't realize is this is political. So I know all the legacy guys that are being investigated. But glass house, who's like over the top, going outside the lines, right? And his former law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. This is a story of political corruption, not a company backdooring a little bit of weed, in my opinion, right? So I would, but what I would do is give people a score. So nobody gets in trouble, nothing happens. I've talked to Metric, they could do this. So X amount of your cannabis is making it to the legal, uh, through the retail thing within six months or a year or whatever, call it a year. So if 15% is your number, you got to walk around with that number, which is fair to your shareholders and everybody else, right? Um, if it's 98%, then good on you. But I think generally people know when they sell to a distributor, you know, which one's going to take it off metric, which one's not. So the number one thing is tax reduction. If we did that, the you know, black market obviously would still exist, 
uh, but we'd be able to compete on an even playing field. I think it goes from 65, 70% down to you know, 15, 20%. Then with that, the guys that are backdooring 20, 30%, even 40, 50% will be fine. Because at the end of the day, they will have, we will have doubled or tripled the legal cannabis market. And if you're backdooring 20, 30%, you'll be fine. If you're backdooring, I don't know, 75 plus percent, then you're going to have a problem. You don't have a real fucking, uh, you know, business model. And look, I've heard this argument about the small farmers. Interestingly enough, the ones who support the litigation against Glasshouse the most are the small farmers, I think, in my experience. And this is because of a couple of things. Anybody with any gain, like, that doesn't have to report two years of audited financials doesn't need the burner distribution system, right? They, they can, like, if, if, if you have a farm and you're up there in Humboldt and you got an acre and they promised you that they weren't going to let some guy have fuck a, a gabillion acres and they didn't keep that promise, you could get your shit gone at the farm, right? Like, those metric tags have no value at all. So, like, they don't need to put it into a distribution. The guys that need to use the burner distribution system for the most part are the ones that need to report their financials. So they're actually all the, the larger companies because anybody who's public and or has visions on being public needs two years of audited financials. So I do think they need to clean that up. It's a tricky question. Uh, you know, we debated a lot on the litigation. Obviously, we knew there would be uh, mixed opinions, but I think it was, uh, you know, kind of got on a tangent here, but we might as well throw the other big elephant out in the room, We Maps and Glasshouse. But the... Uh, you know, we debated it, but I think it's the, the tougher of two choices, which is one, right? Like, all right, it, and look, I've grabbed, knowingly gone out there and grabbed eyeballs. I'm not gonna say that I haven't done that. This was not the case. This was truly a moral, ethical uh, decision for us to do this. Um, we knew there would be more blowback that wasn't necessary, but it was either let the status quo continue and have a guy who really doesn't fucking sell much weed in the legal cannabis market become a power broker in cannabis, right? And look, they're adding a million feet of canopy. Like, come on, bro. They've done the math on it. They know there's no place to sell it. Like, just stand pat. No, they can't stand pat. So now they're on the retail side. Like, they can't retail, right? But at the end of the day, they got this huge thing, which is a big blind eye for them to be able to do whatever they want. Why do they have that? This is just opinion. This is not fact. Their lobbyist is Jason Kenney. Jason Kenney works for Axiom. Who's Jason Kenney? The wine cave. When Gavin Newsom was wearing his mask and they were hanging out at somebody's 50-year-old birthday, that was Jason Kenney. So at the highest levels of California and the responses that we're getting to our litigation, the DCC Glasshouse, again, this is opinion, and Metric, uh, I'm getting sued to fuck, uh, are coordinating their discovery responses. By the way, when we put up the first video, I said I want them to sue me for defamation because I want the discovery. So we actually goaded them into the lawsuit. Now I'm probably saying more than I should. But they had to sue. Yeah, they, they had to sue because at the end of the day, they have to tell their shareholders that it's not true. Here's the questions that Glasshouse will never answer in public because it would, they, they would be worried that they'd be committing fraud. Is the majority of your product ending up on the black market? Their answer would go something like this. We don't know. We're the most heavily publicly audited financial company. And after it goes to the distributor, we have no idea. All right, look, they have the best quantitative minds there. They fucking know, right? That's my opinion. Uh, number two, what do you think your market share is? They can't answer that question. I think it's three, four percent. You mix in all the white labeling, maybe it's five, six, seven. It's not in the 30s, right? And even if they had every store in California, they couldn't move that much product, right? So again, if any journalist wanted to ask them these questions, they won't answer. Ask me the questions, I'll answer it directly. Put them right here, I'll have a debate with them on any fucking forum, anytime, any place, anywhere, and we'll talk about it, right? But like, nobody really wants to talk about it. So at the end of the day, I think that, you know, and look, if you got rid of the tax, the burner thing wouldn't be as big of a thing because we'd all be growing and selling weed for about the, the same price, right? And then, you know, the black market would exist because it's cultural in nature and there's black market forever people and, you know, hats off to them. But at least at the end of the day, we could compete on even footing. Then maybe bring the sales tax back, you know, if you're non-medical. How do I think we change it? They're never going to change it. They're never going to change it. That's my opinion. At least not while Newsom's a live presidential candidate. They're not going to change it. So what I would... But I'm kind of in the beginnings of trying to do, maybe it's 26, maybe it's 28, run the old playbook. What people don't like to hear is, we all in this room know that cannabis is overtaxed. Guess what? We pulled the fuck out of this item at a bunch of cities. People love taxing cannabis. They think we're all fucking rich and that we're all shitting money. This is general population. We also live in our own echo chamber. 
Don't fucking forget that, right? So, like, the general population is going to vote to tax cannabis because they're going to be like, oh, but what about the kids' health care for the SEIU? We're going to lose that moral equivalency. How did they pass 215? Medical. We go back to the same playbook. Not MMID medical because there's only 1,400 in the state. Anybody who could get a doctor rec, uh, you know, Mr. We what's his name? Uh, the one I got, Mr. Weedy, what's his name? Dr. Weedy. That's like 35 bucks, right? Versus you got to go through all these steps. Anybody who's medical pays no tax. You get that on the ballot. I'm starting to talk to some guys to round up, to raise the money to do it. Go out and get the signatures. And then I don't say this in a negative way, but you put forward all the most sympathetic people. That's what they did during 215. But look, politics is optics. So if you want to get a W in 26 or 28, you get it on the ballot. It's always, I think, something you know, that the people have, uh, have to address. And then you look, whatever, whatever it is, the amputee. Sorry, this sounds terrible. I'm just being real, right? The, girl, the young girl with epilepsy, you know, veterans is obviously a super uh, you know, good opt. It's real shit, but it's you know, good optically. And that's how they passed 215. Because in 1996, the state was not ready to say, the majority of people were not ready to say, let's legalize cannabis. But for six people, it was fine. AIDS is no longer a thing, but back then they rolled out cancer patients, AIDS patients. And again, I'm not saying this in you know, the worst sense of it. It's just optically you need to get 50% plus one to win. Right now, if you got a ballot measure together and you said get rid of the tax on cannabis, you'd fucking goddamn lose. And the reason they're not going to reduce the taxes is those earmarks, SEIU, law enforcement, and uh, environmental. They don't actually need uh, the money but those guys aren't gonna give up those earmarks. And if you go to any event here in LA that's political or any other local city, who's the platinum gold, triple emerald fucking sponsor? SEIU, they fucking own the fucking uh, you know, political system. So uh, I don't know how I got on that fucking tangent, what the question was, but uh, ask me a freshie, I'll, I'll keep rifting. Tell us about the SEIU. <laughs> Tell us Uh, so first of all, just want to give you a shout out. You've been posting all the stores on your Instagram for years, and it's cool to see you knock them down. You know, obviously you talked about the compliance, but uh, uh, it shows, and it's cool to see. Um, and then, but with that, you get bigger. Uh, you know, Catalyst becomes a bigger name, and obviously you have a brand and how you talk. So what's your like daily anti-Chad regiment as you as you continue <laughs> to grow? Well, this is a great question, and I'm actually super fucking cognitive of this fact, right? So, like, we all rail against big marijuana companies and blah, blah, blah. But then you're like, fuck, we're kind of, you know, on our way maybe to uh, becoming one. And I think it's the little things that are the big things. And, you know, speaking of the interviews, I'll say that, hey, I'm doing this interview for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, because the little things uh, are the big things. Um, you know, I'm right now getting together, uh, collecting cards, basically all the badges, and putting them in a notebook of all the employees pretty good at memorizing, but when you don't have it all organized, then I'm gonna make my own little notes so I know every single uh, you know, person in the footprint. And then what's unique about us, we never actually bought a dispensary in the traditional way. At first, we thought we would have to, you know, and everybody thinks like, oh, these guys must be crushing, they're well-funded. No, you know, we could barely make the excise tax payment last quarter. But what's happening now, originally we thought we'd have to apply, win, build, take that money, go back in, apply, win, build. What's happening now is a lot of people are busting out of the game or they just need a little bit of win. So those people, I cut them an extra good deal. And, uh, you know, hey, here's your exit if this all works out. And, you know, we get a little bit in the meantime, I guarantee the result on profit and on top line or kick us to the fucking curb. So that's a big way that we're uh, getting the stores now. As far as becoming this big thing that you can't keep in touch or your arms around, I don't know, I'm learning it, you know, and struggling with it. And we keep doing new things. Uh, even just running it, like what we used to be able to get away with when we have five stores, you're going to get fucking creamed when you have 25. And, you know, leveling up or whatever you want to call it, it's the hardest fucking thing ever because you can't hire the people because new stores always lose money. If you're lucky, they're even in four to six months. So you got to suffer, suffer, suffer. Um, and look, you know, I hope we could always run it like a, you know, a small, you know, a small mom, pop business. And I do my best, you know, whatever it is, returning the DMs, fixing orders. Uh, small stuff, right? Interviewing employees, trying to show out every time we have an event. You know, we had a Weed for Warriors yesterday. Yo, I'm going to be there. If we have a grand opening, I'm going to be there. A soft opening, I'm going to be there. You know, the best we can, right? And as you get bigger and bigger, you know, maybe it gets, uh, you know, a little bit harder. But it's a fucking great question. I struggle with it. 
and I'm working on it. And it, it comes in two phases. One, you don't want to lose the culture and get chatted fight up. And two, you don't want to fucking go bust because you can't keep your arms around something that's, you know, so fucking big. I'm driving over here and a big problem at our stores are call outs. And I don't get it. I haven't had a sick day, you know, really other than COVID for like seven years. And, and people are calling out at the last minute. So we're trying to figure out that problem. We have a big internal theft problem, right? Uh, so we're trying to fix that. It's sad. We're putting some more guardrails in. By the way, people debated whether or not I should have posted old girls stealing there. It was mostly done for deter deterrent purposes. Wow. It was probably mostly a fuck you and then also done for deterrent purposes. Yeah. If I'm being honest, it was like, ah. But we, we, we lose over 100 grand a month in shrinkage. Uh, so it's frustrating. Um, but look, all that is stuff that like, again, we're learning on the fly. And then like any lesson you could have learned, you know, that, that you learned along the way is not, you can't approach five the same way as 10, as 15, as 25. So they're all different problems, all macro problems. It becomes like more resolving uh, systems than resolving, you know, individual uh, stores. But again, I'm fucking learning and calibrating texting and fucking talking shit on a few issues not in a bad way with our staff on the way here just things we're always trying to uh tune up and fix retail is a hard sport you got to keep the cost low without taking it off out on your people and you know try to drive revenue it's basic but that's how you you know stay afloat so whatever could do that bro i'll talk as long as you want me to i don't want to overstay my welcome but like you could, if I could turn me on, I'll just keep going. I'm good. How you doing, man? You're good. the man, bro, first of all. Um, is there anything that licensed retailers like myself that pay taxes and that charge customers correct way can do anything about the competitors that charge zero tax completely? What you, as far, oh, you mean like on, the black market? No, like in, in licensed cannabis stores, You're right. their receipt shows no tax. Well, here, zero. Let, me, let me give you some game right now. This is going to be some serious shit that's about to bubble up. Again, since I'm here, we'll put it out. Go look at Health and Safety Code 1108 uh, 1.2. Pursuant to Prop 64, cannabis accessories are not taxable. That's just a fucking fact. Uh, cannabis goods is defined under Health and Safety Code pursuant to Prop 64 1108 1.1. Now, a lot of you might not be aware. Reg 3700 in the distribution years allowed you to separately state those things. So we would separately state them at our distro. And that worked. We got audited to fuck. That worked. Now, they've come up with these new emergency regs. I'm calling them the catalyst regs. If anybody wants to look at 3800 or 3802, those regulations are written for catalyst. Not any other reason they're written for catalyst. And what they're saying is, although the markup used to be 27, you know, 75%, well, 80, then 75, but you're basically paying 27% tax at distro, you could separately state, right? You could no longer separately state under this catch-all law that it's part of gross receipts. But what they've done is they've effectively raised taxes, right? And you cannot tax a cannabis accessory. Go look up the definition of cannabis accessory. Nothing to be left to desire. It's very thorough. It's fantastic. Now figure out how to separately state on your receipt and then have a team of fucking accountants uh, do it by hand on scale. It's almost impossible. But that's the move. So we're under audit again on that move. They're passing emergency regs, which we're going to challenge. We're about, you know, I don't let everything out right away, but this is going to come out. Fucking just came out. Uh, so we're going to challenge those regulations. So under 3700, you could separately state that's their own regs. Uh, the audit is not finalized, but, you know, whatever. So they're saying they don't agree with us on our current position at the retail. Interestingly enough, they wrote our appeal for us because they're trying to get clarity. Emergency regulations can only be propagated under emergencies. So they had a Q&A. In fact, probably going to make a doc, docu-series on it. They had a Q&A. I naturally asked some fucking questions, right? My, my, my first basic question is, what is the emergency that you need to pass emergency regs? There is no goddamn emergency. So they took the authority to pass emergency regs. Then beyond that, they can't answer this question, which is a fun question. In a, in a, in a, in a cartridge, what other than distillate, a distillate cartridge, is not a cannabis accessory. I have 15, 20 emails with that question, and I've intentionally been saying in the email, just so you know, dog, this is gonna end up in court, you're gonna be reading this in deposition, right? So, you know, our current position is unique. Uh, well, it's not unique, but we supersize it. Uh, and then, you know, we try to keep it, you know, as, as good to the consumer as, as we can, but this is about uh, probably to be a public fight. And just so everybody understands, 
a lot of people don't know this. The BOE, what it used to be, the Board of Equalization, uh, they cut it into the CDFTA and the BOE. The CDFTA is a wing of the executive branch. So Nicole Elliott and Gavin Newsom control the CDFTA. I'm telling you, I fucking know our conversations are happening all the way at the highest level of Sacramento on this issue. So the CDTFA is actually part of the executive branch. It's no longer independent. It used to be independent. Why'd they stop making it independent? They were losing tax cases left and right when it was an independent body. So we think we're good on this issue. However, they think we owe them a few million dollars uh, and it's probably gonna be more because we told them we're not changing. They offered uh, you know, to get rid of the penalty. We told them kindly to go fuck themselves. I've probably had 10 hours of phone conversations and a bunch of emails. I'm papering the whole thing for what's gonna be an inevitable showbound. I think I'm one of the biggest, the biggest cannabis issues uh, definitely of this year, you know, maybe in the last few years uh, because at the end of the day, it substantially could reduce your effective rate. So we are aware that people are out there snitching us, which is fine, all in the game. Uh, but they've gotten so many of our receipts that they're, go to our shop, look at our receipt. It's fucking beautiful. Uh, so they've gotten so many of our receipts that they have to do something. And I know, like, it's came back to me, who's talking shit where, who's snitching us, whatever, it's fine. Uh, the fight was inevitable. Um, you know, anyway, that's what was going to happen. So they're all telling them, we're going to take care of it, we're going to take care of it, we're going to take care of it. But 3800 and 3802 are not law yet. We will challenge those regs. And they're a total overstep of what should be allowed. And they're coming from Gavin Newsom and Nicole Elliott herself. By the way, Nicole Elliott on Intel, drunk at a bar, laughing at how broken the, the, the cannabis system is and how broken the metric system is. They know all this. What they're trying to do is set it up for their buddies, get the prices down. And I'm not a conspiracy guy. So that when the big boys come in, you know, they could exit. But as far as the excise tax, like, you know, you gotta, you're not going to get out of the municipal tax. The excise tax, we have a position. I don't even think it's a position. They've been calling it a loophole. Here's the other thing. They said uh, the DCC tried to close it by putting out something. God, I'm giving out way too much now. The DCC, I do like edges, but what are we going to do? We'll just put it out there. The DCC passed something called final form. Final form is a made-up thing. It's like the SEC telling you what your tax rate is doesn't fucking work that way. They don't get a pass the loss. Now they're saying, oh, well, we're just going to go back in and we're going to fix it. And I'm saying, sorry, motherfuckers, you don't get to fix it. Although you punted it to the voters, the only thing that changes a voter pass initiative, especially when it comes to tax rates, is a voter pass initiative. So they can't close the loophole at the state. They'd like to. So what they're doing is they're closing the loophole by making up an emergency for clarification. That does not hit emergency, right? And we were getting away with it legally getting away with it prior and we just barely started doing it to be fair if i fucking knew the whole time i would have done it the whole fucking time uh but the uh we were doing it prior to you know 2023 and they didn't like it so when they moved the position they had to pass these emergency regs we call them the catalyst regs this fight's about to be public so i'll just say it here we're going to take on the entire establishment on this issue the problem is and we experienced this in the abc the cdfta court is a kangaroo court it's no longer a legit court. It's decided by an ALJ who also works for Newsom. So we're gonna have to go to Superior Court, possibly the Supreme Court. 